Hey there, angry faithful. I just wanted to drop in, bend your ear a little bit, get your attention. So if you're not listening, drop what you're doing and pay attention to me because I'm here to inform you that not only can you get your daily, maybe if you're binging it, I'm not sure, that's entirely up to you, but you can multiply your doses of angry me fuckery by paying attention to all of the platforms upon which you can find either the dulcet tones of my voice and David's voice or my pretty face and David's not so pretty face. Anyways, digressing. We, not only on we are on YouTube, we are on Spotify, we're on Rumble, we're on Google, Apple Podcast. We have a TikTok page. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and of course, Facebook. So if you find yourself fuckery deprived curl up with a nice hot mug of shut the fuck up and just listen open those ear holes and be prepared to be cream pied like it's the first time thanks for listening welcome angry faithful we got again eric tansy of failure stop podcast but now we're gonna we're not gonna. We're not gonna talk about your podcast or any uh, or anything. Any questions on mine? We're talking about your new Armado uh, being an author. <laughs> that sounds weird. I know. I know. Uh, I was hoping to have good news for you today too, but the meeting that I was supposed to have today at two got postponed till tomorrow. Oh. So. Do you keeping not- a secret for like three weeks now? And I thought today was the day that I was gonna get to come off the secret, and it's not. Oh, you don't even have a date yet? Because I know it's coming out in November, right? No, no, no. It's Well, it was supposed to come out in November, but way bigger and better things are happening with the book. So oh, okay. now it's like, who knows? Um, the book's done, but um, there's uh, some publishing houses that got a hold of the book, and there's even talk of an attempt at getting it on the New York Times bestseller list. And so they've been working on a strategy with an agent and – don't you have to have a hard book copy for that? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, the book will be a hard copy with oh. pictures. Um, every chapter has one or two pictures in it. Thank um, God. Drawn by Jonathan Bates. Awesome. Uh, difficult to look out images on um, Instagram. But uh, yeah, dude, I never thought the book would kind of go in that direction. I thought it was just going to be a self-published book. I knew the book was going to do well. I started writing the book four years ago, and... And I was just doing it for fun. Like I was just putting stories on paper so that when my kids got older, they would have something to look at. Okay. Um, But I, I, I have a huge sense of humor and comedy is like my thing. And so um, when I started writing the book, I wrote like almost all the funny stories from being a cop. And my wife finally got a hold of the, the book after about a year or so of writing. And she was like, Hey, you know, you get up almost every morning and you, you, you write, like, can I read, what you've written so far. And my wife reads like three books a week. Mm. Um, She's absolutely the smartest human being I've ever met in my life. She, you know, has a master's degree and uh, graduated top of her class, uh, whatever it is, magna cum laude or summa cum laude, whatever it is, but um, from Florida state and she's just brilliant. And uh, I don't read any books and I'm a C student at best, but I let her take a look at the book and she came out of the room after like an hour and she was like, like had tears like in her eyes she was laughing so hard she was like oh okay she was like do you know how hard it is to write comedy and i was like not very fucking hard like (laughs) i basically just write how i speak and uh she's like this is the funniest thing i've ever read like this is hilarious so then she really encouraged me to write it and then um i keep writing and this year like we wanted to have the book out last christmas and so i really worked hard and it got around Christmas time. And then um, I started going back through the book. And then I was like, well, I want to take out this chapter and I want to add this chapter. And then Christmas passed and I kind of like lost focus on it because of the podcast and all this other stuff. And it was probably around July that my wife, like I woke up, she was like, what are you doing today? It was raining. And it was really gross outside. It was my day off. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to sit inside and watch movies. And she's like, I got an idea. How about we finish that book today? Like, let's. I was like, dude, we can't finish it today. Like, I've got months of work. And she's like, the book is, like, done. What do you? What could you possibly have to do? 
And I was like, well, I want to take this chapter out. I want to put this chapter in. I need to write that chapter. And then I got to do this and that. So anyway, long story short, that's what happened. And we rewrote it, uh, which like, it's a dangerous rabbit hole to go down when you're writing a book. Uh, because yeah, you change it, one thing, you want to change another. You want to change yeah, another. It's any kind of art art you're doing most of the time the actual artist or author or a- anybody doesn't even like the stuff and they're always like ripping apart yeah but going on your your wife every great author or anybody that's done anything like really great it's their wives that push them yeah look at oh, stan- yeah biggest one is like stan lee stan lee his, his wife finally came in one day it's like hey write what you want to write stop no uh, let them uh uh, uh, bash you and just write the story that you want to write. And yeah, it is crazy because, um, you know, when you send your books off to editors and things like that, like a lot of people have changes and stuff that they make. It's, 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 it is crazy, like the different perspectives that people have. But with my book, it was really crazy because, like, the editors, like, one editor called me back and it was like, Hey, listen, I, I'm done editing this book. Uh, you're going to have to get somebody else to edit it too, because I got lost in the book and I felt almost guilty. Like I didn't want to edit it because we're coming at it from a perspective of, of educated writers. And like your book is so crude and like not crude as in like the text, but like just the way it's written, it's, it's written in my own, like I misspell words on purpose yeah portray kind of the language of how people speak and things and so they were like man i you know normally what i do is like skim the book and i grade it like it's a paper and and i just go through it and that's how we add it and it was like but your book i like physically had to read the whole book and it was so funny and it was so good and i've never read a book written like this that i i don't really feel comfortable editing it because i don't want to take away from the funny she's like i did what i could and i did what i felt was appropriate but I would definitely get somebody else's opinion. And this is a person that's like been editing books for a very long time. <laughs> and um, so then there was that. And then uh, I finally finished the book, got it edited. I don't know, maybe like back in August, like late August. I, I like, I, I was like, okay, I'm not touching the book again. Like I'm done. And I linked up with um, Jonathan Bates on Instagram. He's a uh, difficult to look out images. And uh, I sent him a manuscript and he just started making comic book art for the book Ooh, and he nice. loved the book and he really inspired me and just like said all these good things and i started sending manuscripts out for the book to different people to have them review it and i started getting just like crazy good reviews back from like really big names and um one one person that i was hoping to talk about today called back and said hey has so-and-so read your book yet we just came off the new york times bestseller with a book that's been on the, the bestseller list for almost three months now have has he read this book yet or have you sent them the manuscript i said no and they were like would you would you want to and i said sure so i did i landed a meeting with the guy um who i'm a huge fan of and i was trying not to be starstruck but like it was crazy because breaking benjamin the band Mm -hmm. um the the guitarist jason rao was staying at my house because they were playing a show in raleigh and he stayed at my house and so i was like dude i got a meeting at two o'clock so i i brought jason from breaking benjamin he was going to go with me then the, the, the meeting got postponed. But anyway, I went to the meeting. I was like starstruck because I was sitting in front of somebody who I have read their books and I've seen their movies. And I just couldn't believe that I wasn't sitting in front of an assistant. I was sitting in front of the guy and it was all about my book. And then they were like, Hey, I think we really have a shot at getting this book on the New York times bestseller list. Like, I think we have a shot. And they're like, if we could put you in front of this publishing house, you know, would you, would you want to do that? And I said, well, dude, I, I that would be like 18 months. Like it, the average wait time to have an editor look at your book from that publishing house is 18 months. And it's like one of the most prestigious publishing houses in the country, country if not the world. And um, he said, what if I could get it for you in 10 days? Give me 10 days. And I was like, dude, I mean, I'm all in. Like that would be crazy. Let's see what happens. So we waited um, 10 days. They decided that they, they agreed to take the manuscript. I gave them the manuscript. And then today was supposed to be the meeting on, like, I, I thought today would be like the meeting of, uh, we're going to pull this trigger or we're not. So I'm like, fuck. Uh, uh, it's, it's one of those things. It's better to wait and, and get good, uh, really good news and just rush it. And just, they just get, oh, fuck, no. 
Yeah. I mean, they said the message said, finish reading most of the book. It's good. Let's talk Thursday. So I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. It's happening. And then so today I waited by the phone like all day. By like three o'clock, I messaged them and I said, hey, were we still going to chat today? And I felt weird even texting them. And they said, dude, just, you know, just red eye flew in from X and um, just playing catch up, blah, blah, blah. Let's, let's hit it fresh in the morning. So, yeah, okay. So you, you'll, you'll hit it. Up what's tomorrow. fresh in the morning mean? I don't know. I don't know if that's nine o'clock, eight o'clock, six o'clock. I don't know if that's 11 o'clock. So again, I'll be playing the sit by my phone and wait. <laughs> uh, that's all good. But uh, on, on this book now, uh, are you, are you doing signed copies also for the pre-orders or have you? Uh, yeah. So we, we got a pre-order list going. It's an email list. Um, which is crazy because um, there's a book out right this second. Um, it just came out, out like I think on Monday, but it's a book about Afghanistan. Um, I believe he gets it. Kettling. Uh, I don't know, but it's a bestseller already. Um, but he launched his book like, like last week with 143 pre-sales. Oh, wow. I got like 300 already and I don't even have like a pre-sale order yet. Oh wow! <laughs> so, um, I'm really excited about the book. I, yeah, I mean, I sign anything for anybody. I mean, I don't give a shit. I hung out with Chuck Liddell for a weekend, and um, I bet you, I bet you, he signed three thousand autographs really? at lunchtime. <laughs> wow! I mean, that motherfucker doesn't stop signing everywhere we went. Lunch, the brewery, we went to a fight. Um, getting to the fight, I mean, it just everywhere you go, it's like at an at an hour and a half. Cause he's going to take a picture with every person and he's going to sign every autograph. Wow. That's it's really cool. So yeah, if Chuck Liddell can sign autographs like that, I could probably sign like a hundred, you know what I mean? If he can sign 3000, I can easily sign like 30. <laughs> and I, uh, also this book is, uh, it, it's funny, but it's, uh, nonfiction, right? Or is it fiction? Yeah, it's nonfiction. It's, it's called pig Latin, a seriously funny, true story. Um, I mean, it's serious. It's a serious book, but it's a comedy because it's basically the I hope they serve beer in hell version of a cop book. A lot of cops write books or most of the cop books that you read are written from aspects of the job solving crimes, you know, um, just kind of like the war, the warrior side of being a cop and and, and the chaos and the confusion. But nobody's ever read, written a book like about the shitty things that cops do like like fuck ups uh locker room banter like nobody's ever written like i mean being a police officer is just like being in a fraternity and the the hazing is there um the 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 office house politics are there and nobody ever wants to dive into that you hear cops say like oh i quit because of the politics or i got fired because of politics or i moved to this position because of politics but they nobody's ever like no cops ever explained to a civilian what those politics are and oftentimes those politics i mean i mean it's not really resigned because of politics politics no i did not resign i did not resign i got fired oh you got fired okay i got an opportunity to resign but i said get, no I'll, I'll just get fired i mean that was for opening a distillery um and that was just because they didn't want the public perception they didn't want an officer owning a distillery they just didn't think it looked good to the public which i'm fine with how they had worded it that way. Instead, they tried to go through hours and hours of body camera footage and tried to start dinging me for every little thing that I did and take me from officer of the year to, you know, public enemy number one in the department when they could have just easily pulled me aside and said, Hey, like, we're not happy about this thing. But I mean, like they, they got me and they hemmed me up for being in my car by myself with my body camera on. Because a lot of times you turn these body cameras on and you forget to turn them off, especially when they first came out. And so they audited my body camera for hours and they found one instance where I was in my cop car by myself talking on the phone um, to somebody else. And I said, God, I hate people. This is why I hate people. It's, it's things like this that make me not believe in humanity anymore. And it was like such a juvenile thing to say, but I was in my car by myself. They made me, uh, they uh, took me off of the road. They took my gun and badge away for seven months for that maybe go to anger management um, for three weeks. The anger management company actually um, put out a memo that they were no longer going to work with RPD because they felt that the department was using anger management as a tool for punishment instead of 
like basically everybody they were sending didn't have anger issues. They were just sending it there as a oh wow a punishment. Um, because dude, you could talk to. I, I mean, I know thousands of people. I don't know that one of them. I don't know that a single one of them would say that Eric has an anger issue. <laughs> I don't even. I I I've, I I I would get angry sometimes, but I I like yeah. I'm I'm the you most know, happy yeah, cheerful. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm noticing this uh, when I when I listen to your podcast. If you actually see something that's physically it shouldn't happen, you you get upset and you sure. talk about it. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to believe that you're going to go out and just do something hurtful to these people. Right. You, you voice your opinion. Yeah. I mean, I do. I mean, I, I say some really fucked up things, but I, I mean, the funny thing is, is that usually it's all in humor and in good fun. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so like I have, I, when they went to fire me, I, I just, you know, they gave me an opportunity to resign. I didn't take that, that thing, but the, the book is, you know, kind of go not a detail about that, but the the book goes into detail about you know coming out of the academy and being treated like a rookie and all the rookie games and losing foot chases, tasing a chick in the pussy on accident, what? You know, who's trying to kill herself? You know, oh uh, my yeah. yeah, that's the story in the book. Oh god, uh, oh my god, I'm gonna buy this book. Yeah. I, I was yeah, already so, book, but now I'm like I'm definitely buying this book now. <laughs> I'll give you a spoiler and I'll just tell you that story. Um, it's not one of like the, it's not even like close to being one of the best stories of that book, but let me, let me, uh, I got a tentative, uh, yeah, <laughs> story time, but yeah. I got a call, um, to a group home and a woman had locked herself in the bathroom and she was about 28, 26 years old. And, um, it was like a halfway house type deal. And so, uh, the dispatchers were like, do you want a check-in officer? And I was like, yeah, no, I'm probably okay. It's just a girl locked in a bathroom. I'll figure it out. So I get to the group home and the, the group home attendant is like, yeah, she's been in the bathroom for like over an hour. We're not sure what she's doing in there, but she won't come out. So I was like, cool. So I walk over to the door and I'm like, I knock on it and I go, Hey, uh, Susie or whatever her name was. I was like, Hey, my name's Eric. Uh, just wanted to check in with you and see what's going on. She's like, are you a cop? I was like, fuck. I was like, well, uh, yeah, I uh, I actually am a cop. Do I sound like a cop? She's like, yeah, you sound like a real douchebag. I was like, son of a bitch. So I was like, um, hey, just real quick, uh, you're not hurting yourself or anything, are you? She's like, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. I said, well, if you say that, we'll have to kick your door in and come rescue you. We'll have to come save the day. And she's like, I don't know why you would kick the fucking door down. It's unlocked. You could just open it. And I was like, oh. So I like jiggled the door handle and sure as shit, it was unlocked. And I was like, fuck. Uh, I was like, okay, well, um, hey, do you mind if I open the door and come in? She's like, you literally just told me you were going to kick it in. So I'm guessing if you have the authority to kick the door down, you have the authority to just open it. And I was like, fuck, man, this chick is eating me alive. So I was like, you don't have anything that's going to hurt me, do you? She said, maybe I do, maybe I don't. Find out. I was like, fuck. So I pulled my taser out with my left hand and I swung the door open with my right. And she was standing in butt naked in the bathtub with a shard of glass, like almost all the way through her wrist. And I freaked. I was like, stop, stop cutting yourself. But she had her hands down by her vagina because that's where she was cutting her wrist. You know, like if you were to hold your hands down, you know, by your waist and slice your wrist upwards. So I was staring at where, you know, her wrists were cutting. And, and anytime you shoot, you always shoot at what you're looking at. So I pulled the trigger on the taser, or squeezed the trigger, and I fucking pulled it. Uh, I yanked that motherfucker. But uh, I yanked the trigger on the on the taser while I was looking at her pussy, and both darts just flew right into her vagina. And she falls out of the bathtub, barely misses the sink, hits her nose on the tile, blood goes everywhere. And she rides the lightning for, you know, five seconds, and she's like, oh, my God. And I was like, are you okay? She was like, you tased me, my fucking pussy. And I was like, what? And I rolled her over and both darts are like center mass right between the labia. And I was like, oh my God, I did. She's like, why would you taste me in my fucking pussy? Blood is going everywhere. Like blood is gushing from her nose. It's gushing from her hand. So I'm like trying to stop bleeding. So I, we put a towel on her wrist and um, handcuffed the towel to her wrist to get the wrist to stop kind of bleeding. And it was wide open. And um, the blood was like dripping down into her mouth. She's spitting it all over the place. And um and I was like, uh, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just like, sit tight. I'm gonna call 911. She was like, you are 911, you fucking idiot. And I was like, I, I know, but like, there's a lot going on here. I need a fucking ambulance. And she was like, you're such a fucking moron. 
And so I call the ambulance and the ambulance gets here and they're like, oh my God, did you tase her in the vagina? She's like, right? That's what I fucking said. And they were like, they were like, why did you tase her in the vagina? She's like, yeah, why did you tase me in my pussy? And I was like, I, I didn't mean to. Anyway, I get her all dressed up. I get the tasers, the barbs out of her vagina. I start walking out the door. And of course, all the women in the group home are sitting in the, uh, in the living room. And they're all looking at me and I'm walking with my head down. And the girl just goes, hey, ladies, if any of you are thinking about killing yourself, do it before this asshole gets here because he'll tase you in the pussy on your fucking way out. Oh, my God. Holding that was difficult. My eyes are watering and I'm, I'm man, I almost bit my lips off. Yeah, I was trying so, I mean, to laugh at the like whole that. story. That is freaking hilarious. I'm I'm clipping that and I'm putting it up on all oh, my social media. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, oh, man. So yeah. we got uh, we got like the artwork to go with that because the artist thought that that was a funny story. And well, yeah, uh, but, I mean, there's just a lot of stories like you know getting lost during a car chase and um, uh, you know getting in foot chases and losing even though the person lost his shoe and then the guys take the shoe and they spray paint it and make a trophy out of it and. And they call it the shoe of shame and and they made me sign the shoe and you know i, I was a really bad rookie i mean i mean i i came in um I, was, I did really well in the academy because of my military background and things like that and so they put me in a very hard spot in a very hard district because they thought i would shine they didn't realize that i'm just retarded all the things i did in the military you know making it through special forces assessment selection i didn't do it because i was a smart guy i did it because i'm a mule um, I'm a hard-headed mule. I can carry heavy shit for a really long way and never get tired. That's my only thing that I have going for me. Um, you know, uh, not much of a, I mean, I'm a, I'm a critical thinker, but like I'm a knuckle dragger. Like I, instead of coming up with a plan, I'd rather just go Leroy Jenkins and like Hell yeah. get to work. I would have been a good Marine, you know? But, I know. Um, I, I totally understand that, that so many of my friends just go out and it's like, Dave, did you even think that through? Pfft. No, no. Thinking involves brains. Yeah, it's like give me something pretty to break. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm still, I'm still on that fucking pussy thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the whole book is just, you know, it's just story after story, and it, and it kind of, it really it talks about being a shitty rookie to to then like, you know, being forced with a put put with a bunch of guys who did not like me and had every reason to, to not like me. I mean, I gave them reason after. I mean, I. I literally was thrown with a group of guys as a rookie. I didn't earn it. Um, I just got it kind of by right. And I fucked everything up and they didn't like me. And uh, it got to the point where I was about to get kicked off the squad just because I could not do anything right. I mean, I mean, it didn't matter what I tried. I, I went to just go clear, not clear a house, but like I went to go to a house where a wanted felon was at. And all I wanted to do was just check off the block that he wasn't there. And I thought, there's no way this violent felon would go to his mom's house on a Sunday morning knowing that he's like the most wanted dude in Raleigh. But I thought if I got up while everybody was at breakfast and I went out and I checked off a couple of these blocks in the afternoon, you know, when everybody was ready to do work on Sunday, we would be able to just, I'd be like, hey guys, I already went to this house, I already went to this area and I've already cleared this, you know, spot. He's, he's not in any of those, so that only leaves this and they would be like man he's on top of shit like he's been working all morning i go to the house i knock on the door and this like 25 year old girl answers the door and i'd already read the call notes that several officers and detectives have already been there and spoken with the mom who lives there and the mom's probably in her 60s so i knock on the door this is mom's house and a 26 year old girl answers the door, and there's no cars in the driveway his car is not in the driveway nor his mom's car in the driveway so I'm just, all I'm doing is knocking on the door to verify that nobody's there and I can tell everybody that he's not there. But I knock on the door and to my surprise, a 26 year old girl answers the door and I was like, hey, Miss you know, Prescott or whatever the name was, I just make names up for the sake of making them up. But uh, I said, Miss Prescott, um, is your son home? Now I know that this girl is only 25 years old and there's no way that the wanted felon is her son because the wanted felon is like 35. And she's like, oh, nope he's not here what 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 do you what what you need him for i'm like oh my god like the if this was the real mom she would already know what i what i want because cops have been here all week so i said oh nothing he's just got some speeding stuff he's got a speeding ticket he needs to take care of he didn't show up to court it's an order 
uh, it's a ordered uh, failure to appear. So like, I just you know need him to come down there. He, he probably won't even have a bond, you know, because we're allowed to lie as cops. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's like, um, yeah. I mean, when I see him, I haven't seen him today. But if I see him, I'll let him know. What does he need to do? And I was like, he just needs to go down to the courthouse and check himself in, you know, and just turn himself over to the to the authorities for this failure to appear. She's like, um, okay. And I knew I should have just left right then and there. I was like, all right, cool. But I didn't because I was fucking stupid. And I said, hey, he, if he's not in the house, you don't mind me walking around the inside of the house and just verifying that he's not in here, do you? Now, I don't have a warrant for the house. I have an arrest warrant for him, but I don't have a search warrant for mom's house. So she could just say no, and I would have to just walk back to my car. And I thought in my brain, there's no way that this chick's not going to say no. I haven't told dispatch where I'm at. I haven't told any other cops in the in the district. Nobody knows I'm there. So she looks right at me and she looks back into the house and she looks back at me and she says, um, sure, you can walk around and see that he's not in here. And I was like, oh, no. And in my brain, I said, don't fucking go in there. Don't, don't fucking don't go in this house. And And it's she's letting me go in there and I've already lied to her about some kind of speeding ticket so i can't just like pull my gun out right because then this bitch is going to be like whoa i thought this was a speeding ticket now you're coming in here with a gun you know and so i walk into this house with no gun out looking for a very violent felon that's like on the top 10 most wanted list for the week and i start walking through and i walk through the kitchen the living room and you know and i was like do you mind if i check the bedroom she's like no go ahead and i'm like fuck man just say no so i can like leave so I go down the hallway and it's it's just nothing but closed doors. I'm by myself. This is like the most unsafe thing in the world to do. And I open the first door and there's the suspect trying desperately to get the window open. But he can't get the window open. It's like somebody had painted the window and it had gotten stuck or something. Mm-hmm. And he just couldn't get it open. So he's looking back at me trying to open this window and I go, whatever his name was, Xavier, stop. And I run in and I try to grab him and he jerks away from me. And he runs and he jumps through some uh, bunk beds. Like he just goes right in between the two bunk beds to the other side. So I run around and then he jumps back through. We're playing this cat and mouse game. And I'm chasing him around this bedroom. Well, this 28-year-old girl, allegedly mom, that's not the mom, she comes in and starts slapping me on the head and trying to yank on me while I'm trying to chase him. So I grab him by the dreads as he's trying to get out the door and he can't go. And I got a full thing of dreads and I yank him back into the room and I sling him onto the ground. I turn around, I pull out my pepper spray. I pepper spray the bitch in the face. She takes off running down the hallway because I just, I mean, I just point blank blasted her with like half a can. He crawls up underneath the bed. I reach down and grab his ankles and snatch him back out. And now it's like, you know, like a horror movie. Like he's like dragging his hands on the carpet Mm -hmm. and I'm yanking him out and he's trying to get out. I'm like, where the fuck are you going to go? So I get him out and I get down on top of him and I start trying to punch him and I tell him to stop. Homegirl comes back in with pepper spray all over herself. She grabs me by my hair, starts yanking me up. He gets up, goes back to the window, pulls out like an Xbox controller, throws an Xbox controller at me. So she's got me by the hair, yanking me backwards. I pull out my pepper spray and spray him as he's trying to, to hit me with an Xbox controller. So I end up pepper spraying him. He falls to the floor in agony and pain. Guess he's never been pepper sprayed, but he did not handle it well at all. I turn around, I blast her in the face with my fist. She flies out back into the hallway. She sits down, covers her face up. She's choking and dying on, on pepper spray. And um, and I reach down and I handcuff him. I stumble out. I'm I'm dying because this whole bedroom is full of, of pepper spray. So I'm yeah, choking yeah. and coughing. My face is on fire. I'm blinking my way through it. I cuff her. I get on the radio. I'm like, Raleigh, help. You know, send me some units, you know. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm working with him, and, I, and I'm trying to get back to him. And now he's handcuffed, but he's now crawled his ass back up underneath his bed. And I can't see. And homegirl's in handcuffs, but I can't let her go because I don't want her to do the same thing that this asshole's doing. Like, now, I'm, now she'll be running handcuffed. So I'm trying to pull her back into the room, but she don't want to go in the room because her face is on fucking fire and being stung by a thousand bees of hell. But I need to get him because I don't know what's underneath that bed or what's going to happen. So I'm having all this thing. Well, you know, I hear the blue lights of, you know, the, the whole, uh, the cavalry coming in. And so everybody's wanting to know where I'm at. And I yell into the microphone and address. 
and all the, the half the squad comes piling in. Now they, I've interrupted them from breakfast, and the rule is you don't do anything on Sunday until after breakfast. And again, I wasn't trying to do anything. I was just trying to be the good guy. And the first guy came through the door. I've got two handcuffed people. I got the you know one, the number one on the top ten most wanted list in my hand. It should be good, but it's not. And he comes in and he was like. They called me Leroy for Leroy Jenkins. And they said, what the fuck, Leroy? That's it. You're fucking out of here. And they snatched the handcuffed girl away from me. And this other guy goes, yeah, man, what the fuck? And he goes and grabs the other dude. And this other guy comes in. And he's just laughing at me. He's a senior officer. And he was like, he's laughing. He just goes, Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> and, um, you know, so then that was it. I was getting kicked off of the squad because that was I had fucked up enough times. And uh, and I, I was genuinely trying not to fuck things up, but I just couldn't stop. So I was getting kicked off the squad, and then uh, a canine officer and another senior officer invited me for dinner uh, while at work one uh, the next day. And I thought, you know, this is it. This is they're going to shame me. So I showed up with a bad mood, and 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 uh, I walked in, and, and and I just I sat down. It was an Abachi restaurant, and I said, "Look, you, I'll fucking give you guys my badge right fucking now. I don't want to hear any of your fucking mouth." Just take the fucking badge and let me leave out of here with a little bit of dignity. I've done nothing but fucking try. And I get it. I fucking suck. But I don't want to hear your bullshit. And they were like, sit down, homie. Sit down. And they're, you know, they were like, look, what's like what here here's what we see the issue is, and here's how we think we can fix it. And that's you ride with us. Get in my my canine cop car and and just ride with me for a couple of weeks and we'll figure shit out together. And it was kind of like, that was it. It was like, uh, I either, you know, quit or I ride with this canine officer for a couple of weeks and try to try to figure out the job. And, and uh, I ended up becoming best friends with the canine officer and then the senior officer. And I really learned how to be a good cop from those guys and my mistakes, you know, throughout the book start to get less and less. And, um, but the book remains funny because of all the banter and then, of course, the new rookies and me fucking with the new rookies as I was fucked with. And uh, it's just a it's a it's an it's a very fun book. Well, it kind of sounds like you really humanity. Uh, hum, you gave it a little bit more humanity to being a cop. Yeah. It, humanizing it, the badge. It's like kind of it was. Yeah. You know, is this. I I don't I, I think you're right there. It's like, you know, for me, cops don't speak the same language as citizens. I also don't believe that we should necessarily have to speak the same language as civilians. Um, but it's nice if you're able to. And I feel like with my unique experiences and this weird kind of shit cloud that followed followed me through basically my whole life until now. Um it really just paved the way that to, to have a voice to actually articulate what cops actually go through. I, all cops go through the same shit that I went through. Like what I went through is no different than, you know, any major big city cop uh, went through. But I just have a way that I can articulate it to civilians to make civilians laugh and to understand it. If, if a real cop tries to tell those stories, you know, it would be like, I then entered the room and the suspect had moved to the western side of the room. I then placed my hands uh, around his hair in order to subdue him. You know what I mean? It's very, you know, whereas, you know, for my book is like, I grabbed him by his fucking dreadlocks and I put his ass on the carpet. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> it just reminds me of the times that, uh, uh the fuckery I, I used to do when I was a correctional officer. Like, uh, we had an inmate, we, we found this like rod and any kind of metal or anything like that. in, in a in a prison, you have to, confiscate it and put it away right. because it could become a weapon anyway we just found this uh like rod about that long well i gave it to my lieutenant lieutenant was like want to have some fun i'm like yeah it's yeah. our shift i gotta do something to uh be happy about so we <laughs> we searched this one guy he's like search his uh inmate search the inmate uh do a pat and he drops the rod right in between his legs well, this guy just freaks out and runs. I was like, I grabbed, I grabbed the rod, handed it to Lieutenant. I was like, Lieutenant, uh, he doesn't realize that we're in a, in a, in a prison and everything's locked up, right? Yeah, but it's funny. Yeah, it's funny. 
but uh, it, it, it's I, I just I love those those stories because it, it it comes from what people don't understand what a lot a day in a life of a cop i mean you could have like a really bad day and what everything like from like i mean you got end of watch was probably the best cop show uh cop movie or cop show that yeah, you I agree. Usually see but the the actual stuff that goes on in a cop's life some some days you're just sitting in your patrol car and you're not doing anything you're just running around the whole neighborhood and mm-hmm. doing nothing which yeah and i mean that's like a big part of my book it's like that you know like one of the worst chapters of the book starts out with me just it's a monday morning first day back at day shift and everything's is really well we're at starbucks coffee and uh at 10 o'clock goes off and then you know uh, you know uh the lives of three people are changed forever um you know i don't want to give too much a part of that chapter away but you know one person one one officer gets their next list sliced open Another one uh, has several bones broken in their body and another one breaks an arm. And then the suspect um, at the end of that story dies. And, and, and it, the whole thing was just, you know, it's really like that, that TikTok where it's like, and nothing can go wrong. Oh no, it all went wrong. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's exactly yeah. how that day went. It was like, Oh, and nothing can go wrong. Oh no, it all went fucking wrong. You know, <laughs> um, the house on fire. Yes. Yeah, like, I mean, just, this fucking mayhem on a Monday, you know, and I mean, there's, there's, there's the serious parts, you know, like my first dead body and, you know, uh, having the skin peel back on the arms of the dead bodies. I'm trying to pick it up and me fighting through the vomiting and being made fun of by the corners um, or the, the, the body snatchers as I call them in the book. Um, but it's two female body snatchers and they just think it's the funniest thing in the world that, you know, I'm about to pass out and throwing up over this, this body that has been in a shower for 28 days and it's basically the body had melted and and trying to get it up and out um every piece of skin or anything that i grabbed just melted apart in my hands and and it it was like it was like pulling a marshmallow off of a stick you know it's really sticky and and it's all over your hands and you can't get it off i mean that's this human body was that's what it was like all over my gloves like everything was just sticky and goopy and 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 i tried to grab the, the arms to pull it out and all the skin just removed itself from the bone all the way up you know to the hands it just degloved the the whole thing and i'm throwing up and and about to pass out and of course it stinks you know worse than anything you've ever smelled in your life and you know and 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 uh and, and it goes through the the kind of the psychology behind it afterwards where i'm sitting in the cop car and i'm i'm, I'm basically depressed you know it's like um i knew that woman's name i knew her, you know i talked to her sister and and I felt that nobody cared. I, I felt that the body snatchers didn't care. My training officer didn't care. It was all laughy and jokey about me fumbling over a dead body. But I realized sitting in the car, looking up at the stars while my training officer was sleeping and snoring, um, that I couldn't believe that I'd only been there for like five days. And this guy, my partner, had been there for 15 years. And so what has he seen in 15 years? That he can just sleep in the cop car. I mean, we just went through the most heinous and disgusting scenario that a person could think of in regards to a dead body. And he's just sleeping and it's okay. And I realized it's because they don't humanize those people. And I had, I had humanized that woman. I had learned her name. I had talked to her sister. I had tried to figure out how she passed away in this shower and how nobody knew that she was dead in the shower cycling from hot to cold for 28 days. And and the reason why I was fucked up in the car at the moment and sad and trying to hold back tears and everything was because I had humanized it. And I knew that if I was going to survive in that career for any amount of time, I had to learn to be like them mm. where you don't give that thing a name. It's the body. It's grab the body. It's not grab Angela. It's grab the body, put it on the gurney, take it outside. Damn. It really stinks. Not she, not he, not Angela or whatever the name is. And, and, and that's kind of how I summarized that event was like, okay, for now on, these are all going to be it's and things. They're not going to be she's and he's because I'll, I'll go fucking crazy. Yeah. So the book does have some serious turns, but of course, you know, as though that's a serious moment, the way I write, you know, her, her being degloved and, you know, um, peeling her off of the carpet, like some Velcro, like it, it, I, I say it very, like in a very comedic, way but then but then you know then i humanize it for a minute and then i 
you know, dehumanize it at the end. So really paints a picture that civilians, you know, don't really get to see. You would never really be able to articulate that. I mean, of course, civilians know that you as a cop see dead people, but their vision of a dead person and your vision of a dead person are completely different things. You know? Yeah. Like they, they see you as working with dead people as you know, the hands crossed over the chest, the eyes closed with two nickels waiting to cross fiddlers green, not fucking a black pile of goop um, that's melted into the carpet that uh, you're trying to use a flathead shovel to get the head and skull off the carpet. Yeah. When, once you mentioned about ripping the flesh off that person, I just remember this one time we accidentally, uh, well, another officer accidentally uh, uh, pepper sprayed into a guy's cell who he's trying to light something. Pepper spray is flammable. flammable he, yeah. he torched the guy. Great. We had we had to move him. The cuffs wouldn't work because his, his skin was just coming right the fuck off. Oh, damn! Yeah. He really got burned. Yeah, yeah. It was it was not pretty. So when I when I pepper sprayed homeboy in that bedroom, I had yanked his hair back and he was screaming and I had and I and I was trying to get the pepper spray canister around him, which means I was going to spray myself, too. But when I yanked his hair, it forced his mouth open. So he was like, ah, and when I blasted the pepper spray, it all went down his mouth. <laughs> so that motherfucker was trying to crawl under the bed. I, he was just, you know, he just wanted mercy. But, you know, there's no mercy when it comes to pepper spray. I mean, once it's on you, no, it's a thousand God, I, bells from I, hell. I, that, that's one thing about being a CEO that I hated was the fact that if I ever had a pepper spray, I would beat the holy crap out of the person with the pepper spray bottle. It's yeah, the- I was like that when somebody like you see a cop beating some ass and they're like, why didn't you just pepper spray him? And I'm like, you know, from the outside, yes. But I'm telling you, I'd rather have my ass beat than be pepper sprayed. Mm-hmm. I'd rather you punch me in the face like six times than pepper spray me once. Now, in the book, do you have any kind of because uh, being Halloween and everything, it, and I watched this one video to where a uh, cop goes into this house and the guy guy was just energetic and everything, but he had like snakes everywhere. Mm, I'm and, fucking out. And do you ever have, do you have a do you have a do you have a story of a not today moment? Uh, not maybe like not in the book. I mean, I do like the, the the very last story in the book right before I decide that I'm going to to leave law enforcement. Yeah, I mean, it, it was. I don't want to give that that story away because that's you know like a big part of that's a spoiler alert. But I'm, yeah, like I'm, I'm, I, that was that was a moment in the book where I was like, yeah, fuck this, you can leave, and I'm also not going to be a cop anymore. Like this is fucking stupid. But no, I mean, one time I was searching a car. I didn't put this in the book, but. Um, I, I searched, I was searching, I was actively searching a car and a dude said, Hey man, just FYI, I lost my snake like three days ago in that car. And I'm not sure where it's at, but it's somewhere in the car, I think. And I said, excuse me. And he was like, yeah, the tank is in the back seat. And so I was like, like my hand was underneath the front seat. So I pulled my hand back. And I look in the back seat, and sure as shit, there's an empty aquarium. And I was like, I don't give a fuck how many drugs. I, I don't care if there's a kilo of Colombian Bam Bam up under those fucking You can have it. I'm, yeah, fair enough. I said, I said my exact words were, fair enough, dude. Totally, fucking, you can go. I, I totally agree with you on that one. This Not fuck, I didn't even ask him what kind of snake it was. It could have been a grass snake. I don't know, but. Doesn't matter to me if there's a fucking snake in a car. Nah, they ain't not. There's not a amount of drugs in the world that I give a fuck about that's being guarded by snakes. Yeah. You know, this, you win. Touche. <laughs> so do you have I'll a? Get you a next time. Do you have an exact date when that book's coming out? Or, you know, when when I was going to self publish, um, and, and I was gonna self publish. I mean, and I was gonna self publish through Amazon and get the hard cover and we designed the cover and you know i had done all of the legwork man i've got the reviews i've got some really awesome reviews for the book and, and the book is is super entertaining from the minute you open it to the, you know you know like when you open a book and it's a hard book and you got the cover on the side of the sleeve it's usually has the bio mm-hmm. you have like a picture of the author and then like a little bio there on the side you know my bio says uh uh c student mediocre cop passionate lover 
And then, and then the page next to it says, this book is dedicated to all my homies in Raleigh Central Prison. You guys earned it. Special thanks to the homeless man at Mernie Camden who said the words that I'll never forget. Hooking, dealing. Donald Trump knows the truth. Donald Trump knows the truth. Donald Trump. And then the book starts. So, like, there's nothing, like, that's not, you know, I didn't put, like, special thanks to my wife who's always been there for me. And, you know, I mean, it's the whole book is, uh, so on the back cover where you have the reviews, you know, there's, like, a really nice review, and it's, like, from Mike the Cop. And then another one, which is, like, Jason Rao, Breaking Benjamin. And then there's another review that's that's another famous person. I don't want to say it yet because I don't want to give all the, the, the surprises away. And then the, the fourth one says, fuck the police, or fuck 12, loked out for life. But seriously, this book was hilarious and very well written. Little Sweezy, eight tray crips. <laughs> <laughs> that's <fucking> hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the whole book is just, uh, it's, it's I, a I, lot of fun and. I want I'm, as soon as you get it to where either a it's a movie or two it's a TV series. You need to text me that shit because I'm, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be so fucking happy because it sounds like I, I would I, it's something I would just watch too. I so a lot of people that uh, that have had the manuscript in their hand um, has said you know like things like man that's the funniest book I've ever read or like holy shit that totally changed my perspective on cops like. I knew being a cop sucked, but I didn't, like one guy was a ranger from Ranger Battalion, and he was like, "Dude, I served in Ranger Battalion, Ranger Rat, and like I'm to be honest with you, I wasn't like super thrilled to read the manuscript of a cop book." He's like, "But holy shit, like I want to be a cop now. Like that that shit sounds <laughs> fucking awesome, you know? Because you know you, you you talk about all the foot chases and the, and and just bank robberies and but you know I don't really tell it from the side of the story, uh, you know. For, for I'll give you one more little tiny." small story in the book that doesn't really give much of the book away, but I pull over a dude. Uh, I don't pull over a dude. A guy wrecks on 440 and I'm on my way to get a coffee and donut at 4 a.m. And the donut place is at the very next exit, but there's a white Ford F-150 that spun out in the median. It was like 35 degrees outside, 34 degrees. So probably hit some black ice and spun out. And so I get out of my cop car to make sure that the person's okay. And it's a Mexican, a younger Mexican guy um, who's definitely like, like, uh, like thugged out, you know, like the thugged out Mexican, you mm -hmm. know, what I'm talking about like the one yeah, with the long everything dicky like shorts. Low down. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like the... a Chapo kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah, the... yeah, exactly, dude. Exactly. So it was one of those guys and he was like, he was super aggravated that I pulled over to make sure he's all right. And I could tell he was drunk, but I could also tell that he wanted to fight. I really wanted a coffee and donut. And it was four in the morning and I get off at six and I didn't want to start fuck fucking with somebody at four o'clock because you you know that that would put me home around 11 o'clock in the morning and and I, I don't want you know i want to be in bed by eight so i decide very quickly i'm not gonna fuck with this guy but he wants to fight and i don't so i say hey homie listen i don't know what's going on obviously you're drunk but i'm not in the mood to deal with you and we can fight right here on the side of the street and that's fine you might win but i got like 700 dudes that will come in and then you'll spend the rest of the night and it's like 50 something degrees outside, 30 degrees outside, and you'll spend the whole night fucking running from cops, freezing your ass off. Or, or we can both get what we want right now. You can put your keys in your hand and throw it as far out into the woods as you possibly can. And he took a second, he looked at it, and he was like, What? And I was like, Look, you get what I get what I want, which is you not driving because you're drunk. And you don't have to fight with 700 cops and go running around like a fucking weirdo all night. So he thinks about it for a second. He reaches down in his pocket. He grabs his thing of car keys. And, and he goes, how far I got to throw him? I said, as far as you fucking can. And he's like, well, how are you going to know? And I said, don't push it. So he launched those fucking keys. I mean, he launched them. And I said, thanks, man. Don't drink and drive. You're better than that. And I get in my cop car. And I go about 400 yards up the road uh, and, uh, and up to the donut place. And I get to the donut place and I tell everybody's like, dude, what did you stop on the way here? And I was like, nothing. It was a car that spun out. I was just making sure they were okay. Um, they didn't have any keys on them. So and I'm pretty sure they were drunk. So I, I don't know what this story is there, but the driver wasn't there. And I'm like, oh, okay. So we're eating our donut, having our coffee, and a state trooper gets in a foot pursuit and he's headed towards Joan Sausage Road, the exit, the, the on-ramp. And we're there. That's where we're at, getting coffee and donuts. 
So we book it out of the thing, and sure enough, they're chasing this guy up the on ramp, and we end up tackling him in, in the whole nine yards. And uh, the guy's like, "Get him! Get him! Get him!" Because so I was like, "Hey, what are, what are we doing? What are we arresting this guy for?" Like, and he was like, uh, "I said he doesn't even. Have, I know he's drunk, but he don't have any keys or nothing." And the the dude on the ground, he's like, "Yo, that dog made me throw my keys out in the woods." I was like, "Shut the fuck up!" You know, <laughs> and um, and uh, the state trooper is like. That truck is stolen, and this guy's wanted for murder times two out of South Carolina. Oh, shit. Yeah, I remember you telling this story on uh, one of your podcasts, but I'd still love the story. Yeah. Like, so, you know, just oh, a lot of fuck-ups. It, it's, it's one of those moments is like, oh, he fucked up like me. That's not that bad. He's actually yeah. Really cool. <laughs> yeah. And the guy was like, this dog just let me go. And I was like, shut the fuck up. I ain't never seen you before, bitch. <laughs> You don't know me. <laughs> I was like punching him with a state trooper. Didn't he just say something? No, he didn't. No. He was like, yo, that's Officer Tansy. I was like, shut the fuck up. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's like the whole book. Just shit like that, man. But it, it's just the funny, raw, ridiculous, hilarious, um, sometimes serious, but I sum it up really quickly with a joke or or something super irreverent. Um, to make you just go fuck that guy's dark as shit, you know. And there's a lot of dark humor, and I use a lot of dark humor from from firefighters and from EMS workers that show up on some of these scenes because they're not, you know, they're not innocent of being pieces of shit either. So, um, you know, they they do a lot of fuckery too, and and so I put a lot of that in the book. Yeah, I had a I had a firefighter. I was talking to a firefighter one time, and he had a. There's this one guy. It was in the uh, Fort Worth area, and this guy just. And he keeps on like has a he has a colostomy bag, and Ugh. and he wouldn't use just the medical style colostomy bag. He'll use like chip bags and stuff like that. And oh my god, guy was just, yeah, guy was just disgusting. And he mm. would go and it's like, man, every time uh, we dreaded going over there because we know he would have like a shit bag with like potato chips or some shit like that. Fucking gross, dude. Yeah. But it, it's, I mean, I mean, I've I've talked to you know mask people and they have some really fucked up stories. And if you actually had like, like really high hopes of humanity, that would break that shit down really fast. I can't believe that there isn't more EMS books out there because I think EMS workers are one the most underrated uh, first responders out there. They don't besides, get paid much either for what they do, dude. They fucking, I mean, those dudes are real heroes. Like yeah, I've, they're I have doctors. seen those dudes. I've I've seen those dudes bring back the dead. They're like, I mean, miracles, man. And nobody ever knows. Like some EMS worker needs to write a fucking book or like have me write a book for them. Um, you know, that that might be my next project. If this project goes well, I you know, I might follow around some EMS workers and, and write a book. Um I you know that, about EMS because I got a thousand stories about EMS too, like just you know, just straight doing fucking wizardry and witchcraft. You know. Yeah. And some of the some of the story, it's it's, I mean, uh, one of my close friends, he he was uh he was an EMS driver, and he would he would I was like I can't believe this person couldn't uh be kept alive only because of uh, uh oxygen. And mm -hmm. the nurse wasn't getting, uh, wasn't getting uh, any kind of oxygen, and it, it was a fucking nurse, and they couldn't switch it, uh, switch it out. <laughs> that kind of stuff, just switching yeah. out a patient from uh, their EMS van to the freaking. He has so many stories about how many times he's had to like talk down to nurses and almost like put put a chokehold in them. It's like, hey, you know, I um. Know. I, I didn't put this story in the book, but um, there, uh, there was a woman, a pregnant woman, and um, she got her from moral artery exposed, um, an exacto knife. She was trying to kick another prostitute, and the prostitute pulled out a exacto uh, knife, sliced all the way down from just about almost where the vagina, like where the leg meets the pussy, and mm -hmm. just sliced almost down to the knee, and it flayed the whole entire inner leg open, and and it was definitely like it was not femoral the the femoral artery was exposed we could see it but i couldn't see because i'm not a fucking doctor 
All I know is that that was like the most blood I had ever seen. And I saw the stabbing. I was sitting at the end of the street watching the fight right before it started and was just starting to drive down there to break it up when I just see the whole entire pavement turn red. So I jump out of my car. Of course, everybody runs. And I pull a tourniquet out and I tourniquet this bitch and I put her in the car and we roll. And so we meet up with EMS halfway to the hospital. We tra- we transfer out. We get down to the hospital and uh, they're calling it a femoral thing. And we get into the hospital. There's a pregnant woman and this Indian ner- doctor. And she was like, OK, OK, before everybody slow down, everybody slow down. Stop. And she's like, why do we have another tourniquet on another patient? Who did this? And we're all like, I'm just standing there. And I've got blood like all over my legs because I knelt down in the blood to, to put the tourniquet on her. Mm-hmm. And she's like, just because she's sliced in the leg and there's a lot of blood doesn't mean we need to do tourniquets. Tying a tourniquet that high on somebody's leg is going to do more damage than anything good because like we need to get that off of her now. Um, and so they loosen the tourniquet and blood shoots like 20 fucking feet. Like it sprays the wall. It sprays the ceiling. I mean, in one ginormous pulse, it just, cow. and she's like, well, let's go get her into the trauma. And I mean, it was all hands on deck dude. like fucking doctors everywhere at the end, after about two hours of just crazy shit, the, the doctor comes out there and she's like, I want to talk with you for a minute. And I'm standing there and she's like, I want to apologize. And I a hundred percent want to say that you saved that young lady's life. She's pregnant. She's lost like it, the, the formal artery was exposed. She severed everything around it. Like da, 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 like the tourniquet. The, the, like if you would not have tied a tourniquet, she absolutely would be dead. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I said, no problem. She said, I'm just so used to seeing people tie. And when I saw a tourniquet that high on a leg, it scared me because you could really do some damage, but you did perfect. And I, and I just wanted to say that you saved this girl's life and you should be proud of yourself. And I said, well, thank you so much. Whatever. Well, my district where I worked, we don't put in for, for life-saving awards and neither do our supervisors, unless it's something crazy because everybody saves a life every day. Yeah. <laughs> you would get like a hundred thousand, you would get like a hundred life-saving awards a year. You know, if, it's, only, every time it's probably one of those things where it's the, like how many accrued, from that time frame. Right. Like, so we just most points. So I had, I had, I had worked, you know, I had been a cop for five or six years at that point and I'd never gotten a life-saving award, even though I had saved a fuck ton of lives, I'd never gotten a life-saving award. And, um, the award ceremonies, it came, to, came around that year and my name was on the list and my name, I was, not only was I getting a life-saving award, but I was getting another award. And, uh, I, you know, I went to my supervisor. I was like, yo, why did you put me in for a lifesaving war? Because I'm going to get made fun of. Because everybody's going to be like, oh, you know. He's like, I fucking didn't. He's like, I didn't put you in for any lifesaving war. And I was like, well, who put me in for lifesaving war? Because it was kind of shunned. It was kind of like a, that's something that ribbon chasers go after. Mm-hmm. And our our district, our squad, we're not ribbon chasers. We're fucking workhorses. And come to find out after the award ceremony, the doctor was there. But that that doctor had literally called the city and put me in for a life saving oh wow for okay. time to turn again but you know she went from being a huge stone cold bitch to being like all right fuck i was wrong yeah it's it's so strange how uh communication on one one department to another department is totally different and then when you actually realize it's like oh he actually did something really smart and then you just realize it's the department's retard so <laughs> ah yeah uh i was like that's a lot of fucking blood and uh i'm gonna make that stop right now and um man i tied that tourniquet when i was tying that tourniquet and that was probably the first real i mean i used tourniquets before to stop bleeding but i didn't like really wrench them down now, i thought i did i thought i had tied a tourniquet before that incident but that incident I really learned what it's really like to tie a real fucking tourniquet that I just kept turning until the blood stopped. Right. Like they, they say, turn it like a faucet, like keep turning until the blood stops. And and I mean, I was wrenching down on this girl and she was screaming louder, heavier than any woman I've ever heard scream in my entire life. And I damn near broke the post on that tourniquet. I was turning so hard. I was turning so hard 
that I was sore the next day in the back of my arm. <laughs> Jesus. A, was it because I because I because I twisted it with my arm and I held it like that because I it was so tight that I was having a hard time securing the the rod. Oh. Um and and my hands were slipping because of all the blood and everything. Um and so like I had held it for a hot second trying to like contemplate my next move once I got the blood to stop coming out. Um, oh. you know, but like that was like, man, that's a real fucking tourniquet right there. And I bet you that hurt like a motherfucker. I mean, it, just you know, go up about six inches from your kneecap. That's about where I tied it. So yeah, I've 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 seen maybe a little higher, maybe actually a little higher than that, maybe like uh, eight more or less up to the hip, like just just below the like yeah, uh, like pretty much the middle, the middle between your knee and your your pelvis. No, oh, like okay. right there at the fattest part, the fattest fucking part of your leg. That's where I had to tie that tourniquet. Oh, okay. And, uh, and, and the tourniquet went over the wound because the wound was sliced literally from from the, the like the corner pocket, like of the chode, <laughs> like the ass ball connector, all the way down to the side of the kneecap. And I mean, I mean, it just the exacto, and I pretty much went all the way to the bone. Mm. Um, like I said, the femoral artery was exposed, and I have a picture of her femoral artery on my phone. Jesus. Mm -hmm. mm. Because when when we got there, they were like, hey, you know, the tourniquet, before they cracked it and it blood sprayed everywhere, the EMS worker zoomed in and took a picture and then said, you know what that is right there? And she like pointed to her phone and she's like, that's her femoral artery. That's how close this woman came to death. And oh, I was like, wow. holy shit. And I was like, will you send me that? And they're like, yeah. And they texted it to me. Send me that shit. So I've, I've got, a, got an awesome picture of a chick's femoral artery. So uh, there was a there. There's also one more thing. Have you ever? Were you talking in the book that have you ever had a moment to where you just forgot what you're doing? Like, oh my god, I'm a cop. Maybe I should stop this. Um, I mean, no, not really. I mean, there was like a moment where I was chasing a suspect when I was brand new. I was a rookie. I was with my training officer, and we were chasing a guy through the woods. And I got on the radio. And I said, Raleigh, foot pursuit. And I think this was my second foot pursuit ever. Mm -hmm. So it was like the second week of, of being a cop. And they were like, okay, Raleigh. They were like, all right, 420, whatever whatever I was back then on training. 421, I think is what I was. And they were like, uh, go ahead, 421, with a suspect description. I was like, he looks like a Guido from Jersey Shore. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody was like, what the fuck? So we get down into the woods, and the guy stops. Like, it's just silent. And we're in this thick ass fucking woods in the middle of North Carolina. And my training officer is like, I, I'm running. I'm, I'm ahead of my training officer. He's right behind me. But then, you know, I could hear crack, crash, crash, crack, 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 crash. You know, as we're skipping through the woods and then silence. So I was like, Ch -ch -ch. and my training officer was like, what? And I pulled out my gun and I said, move your foot. And he goes, why? I was like, I want to put one in the ground. And he was like, wait, what? I was like, I'm going to shoot around into the ground because that's going to fucking scare the suspect and he'll take off running again. He was like, are you fucking crazy? Put your fucking gun away. You can't fucking do that. And I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. We we can't do it. In the Army, we could do that. <laughs> but in the police yeah. department, you can't give warning shots into the ground to, to scare somebody. So, <laughs> yeah, that was definitely one moment where I was like. And then he went and told everybody. He was like, this motherfucker was going to put some rounds in the ground to make the suspect run again. <laughs> and everybody made fun. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, it wasn't gonna hurt anybody. Yeah, Fucking two bullets in the ground. Unless, be unless, unless he was like right underneath you. I mean, and he was so like, yeah. But yeah, so couldn't do that. And um, pom pom pom. But um, yeah, that was probably like one of those times where I forgot that it was the police. <laughs> I mean, and there was times like there was one dude, you know, he 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 was handcuffed on the side of the road, and he asked, well, you know, what if he went and harassed my wife and my children and. I forgot I was a cop after that. I was like, you know what, motherfucker? You come to my fucking house. I'll end your entire fucking bloodline. Whoever gave you that last name, Welcher, I will fucking find every Welcher, and I will end your entire fucking bloodline. And everybody was like, yo. <laughs> I've used that one before. That I mean, They're like, well, you can't say that shit. And I was like, well, I fucking I guess, just did. So I guess, I guess correction officer. Dick. Correction officer and, and cops totally different because I've like uh, there was this one time. Uh, one of the inmates come, oh, was coming in. This is when I was fairly new. He comes up to me. He's like, there's nothing you can say. I'm going to fuck you up, blah, 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 blah. I was like, 
I will fucking skin you alive and use that skin as a condom to fuck your mother if you don't fucking back up. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. He he backed. <laughs> yeah, he's like, uh, that's really fucked up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't say that shit as a cop. You would get fired in a heartbeat. But that was But yeah, it's a it's a fun book, man. I think um uh, one of the people that reviewed it said something like, if you if you are a cop, I mean, if you love cops or you hate cops, um, and there's a there's plenty of uh, fuel for the fire of debate. But this cop, ad- this ex cop adds all the fuel to the flames to incite everyone. So whether you're a cop, not a cop, want to be a cop or hate cops, this book's a wild ride or some shit like that. And I thought that was kind of a cool review. It's not going to go on the back of the book, but it was a nice it, it'll be a review that goes like on the the Amazons and the Googles. But um, I thought that was really cool because, I mean, yeah, it's like even if you hate the police, this book's still going to make you laugh. And it's going to yeah. give you tons of fuel to, to know why you hate the police. Because, I mean, I do a lot of things that make me a piece of shit in the book. If you love cops, there's a lot of fuel for for more love of cops because you're like, man, this is there's a lot like this cop did a lot of things. Say, you know, a lot of shit went down and he did a lot of good things. So, I mean, I just put it all in there. I put all the good, all the bad, but I made it, I, I told it, you know, because my life is just funny in general. So mm-hmm. it's not like I had to add the humor to it. I just put the humor in there and, and people laugh. And then I think it's a funny book. It, it's funny that it's not funny. It's definitely going to be like one of those, you want to cancel me? You absolutely will have everything you need to cancel me. Everything You'd have the, all the ammunition for it. Yeah. I'll never be able to be a politician or run for politics. After after the book comes out, ever. you know, it's just like, holy shit, this fucking guy. Are you serious? You know, like singing Kumbaya to a dying gang member, like <laughs> telling him to go to the light. Hey, man, just go to the light. You've had a real good run at it. Kumbaya, <laughs> my lord. Kumbaya. Uh, and he's just like, oh my God. He's gargling at me. Everybody's like, dude, that's fucking dark, dark as shit. I just oh, want him to shut the fuck out, up. Man. Yeah, I just want him to die already. He I just want some more of that fresh oxygen. <laughs> but um, can we put a yeah? So shit like that, probably people won't like. They're like, man, that's <laughs> fucked up. You didn't try to save him. No, he shot himself. Like, I'm, I can't fucking fix somebody that shot themselves in the throat. <laughs> Guy's missing a throat. Nothing you've trained me to do fixes that. So <laughs> I'll just sing <laughs> to him. <laughs> and I'll tell him to go to the light. All right. And well, that's did. a. Uh, that's all we got for today. Uh, but I'll set this up for Sunday uh, just to let you know. And nice. Everybody else, uh, everybody else know. But a- anywhere you can get a book, catch ta- uh, ta- uh, Eric Tanzi's uh, book, Pig Latin. Again, Pig Latin. Pig Latin, a seriously funny true story. 